And now gently moving up the palm so they're in front of the forehead with the same distance. And the same thing, just allow them to move closer and further. Sometimes with our hands up here, we start to awaken the six chakra and maybe see a little more imagery. So now in the mind's eye, and with the eyes closed, you could see some image of the hands as they move closer and further. You might see an image of your face and body as they move closer and further. start slowing down from the daily craziness as we tune into physical energy. And gently the palms move out to the side and begin to rise up above the head. Now becoming aware of the energy point at the very top of the head, just noticing some sensation. Slowly the hands start to sweep down. Very, moving very slowly, then feeling the sensation between the eyebrows as they sweep down. Sensation at the base of the throat. The center of the chest. Sometimes it that sense of energy feels blocked or open, just notice. Oh, oh. The solar plexus. The center of the middle of the abdomen. Very good, good sense. And the base of the torso, and once again the palms begin to move up. Can't you see everyone with your eyes closed? 
I remember it over looking up and saying, can you see the spirits above the stage? Oh. So now invite your soul family. Invite your soul family into this room. Those who have passed, those who are here on this planet, those who are yet to come, they're all sitting here. You could feel the room getting really crowded with these smiley faces and beautiful smiles and glowing eyes. Just feel that soul family.
pushed a little bit and said, oh, it's really nothing. <laughs> Full tank messes. So it's just so incredible. And since Baba was one of Hilda's teachers, I consider that a, a Hilda blessing too. So just we, we are so grateful. And one thing that, another miracle that I've really learned is the miracle as you were doing so beautifully of loving yourself and by just sending myself more love, actually not sending myself, but just being in that loving condition, I found it so much more helpful, as I've shared with some of you here, to be able to love other people and to look them in the eyes, even if they are not that close to me, and just share that with them. And I have seen huge, huge miracles. So endless blessings for everybody, and I love you. I had a financial problem uh, because I'm spending the whole day thinking about God, writing books, not practicing war, and I needed five thousand dollars. Sai Baba actually came down. I saw him. Well, one day I, I, I was really short, and, I, and somebody locked me out of my apartment. Right? They put all my stuff outside, and there's no place to go. So I had to go to the, the shelter. I went to the shelter instead of calling the police. I had the right to call the police and open the door. Right then, Daniel went into the lion's den and he survived. So I spent three days in the shelter and I realized I could survive anything. Oh, okay. Thank you. Hi everybody, Hello. my name is Devante. Um, my miracle was uh, learning how to just surrender and give it all to the masters. Today I had, oh, yesterday I forgot to call accessory. I had no idea on how I was gonna get here tonight. I was wondering, should I call this person to see if I can get a cab? Should I call, try to call this care place? Should I call the care place in my neighborhood? I was just like, what should I do? But it really was just surrender because I left my job, walked outside, one cab wouldn't stop, the next guy did. And he brought me here so peaceful, so relaxing, and here I am tonight. So namaste. God bless you all. I was supposed to speak later, but I might as well just start in now. This Larry's a little late. I want to say that this is a family. This is a family of builders and gods and all the other masters that bring us together. And that if you have anything to share at any moment, if you want to say something about anything that's being said, please feel free tonight to do so. Because it's the holidays and family gets together on the holidays, right? And we've been a family for a really long time. Some of us since 1975, 71 even. So this is my family and I love you all. And I want to wish you all happy holidays. Thank Happy New Year, Merry Christmas. Thank you celebrated Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. <laughs> Happy Kwanzaa. Alhamdulillah, if you do that. I think there's a Muslim holiday coming up that's similar. It's pretty dark times out there. There's a lot of terrorism. Probably pretty close to very disastrous possibilities. But for the devotees of God, these are the greatest times. This is the opportunity to become who we are, to be who we are. Becoming, as one of my greatest teachers has said many times in the past, becoming is lost in being. I mean, how many years do we have to become before we are? When in reality, the first breath we took as physical beings on the planet, we were who we are already. So tonight, let's approach this a different way, a slightly different way. Let's not think of ourselves as human beings striving to become God or enlightened 
or in Nirvana, or however you want to say it. But let's think of ourselves as God incarnated on Earth, who are striving not to be lost in being human beings. Because that's really the truth. So I'll give you a full, small example. Narayan was Vishnu's greatest disciple, supposedly. Always saying the name of God, always, you know, thinking about God. And Narayana asks Lord Vishnu, Who, who's your greatest disciple? Obviously there was some ego there left, so how can he have been the greatest disciple? So Lord Vishnu says, see that farmer down there? Toiling away in the fields? That's my greatest disciple. Lord, Lord Narayana, or he is already, says, what? Are you kidding me? What? I thought I was. He says, no, that's my greatest disciple. How can that be possible? So, there's a double-header story. Lord Vishnu, God, says, he wakes up in the morning. First thing he says my name. He says it three times. Then he goes through the day, focusing on his work all day long, only tilling the soil, never takes an extra penny, never cheats anyone, just goes ahead and farms the land. When, it's, when the crops are ripe, he, he reaps them, then he goes out, he sells them to people who cook, and it sustains life. But he only takes what exactly is his due and nothing more. He's not greedy. At night, when he goes to bed, he says my name again three times and falls dead asleep. He wakes up in the morning and does the same thing every day of his life. That's my greatest disciple. So Lord Narayana is speechless. But he learned a great lesson. The humility, which is essential on the path, he began to cultivate. Another time, the same Narayana, I guess before he became one, because now he's Narayana, but the fact of the matter is, he said to uh, Lord Vishnu once again, you, you send people to earth and they forget about you. How is that possible? How can they forget about you? They come to earth and they forget who they are. How is that possible? Lord Vishnu says, it's very simple. I'll show you why. He says, okay. He says, well, are you willing to go to earth? Yeah. Okay, okay. So, Lord Narayana incarnates. Except he's not Lord, I call him Lord. Narayana incarnates as a pig. He's born as a pig, he grows up, he, he eats things in the mud, rolls in the mud, has a family, when he gets old enough, I guess, he has little piglets, he's rolling in the mud, he's having a great time, 20 minute orgasms, and pigs have that. So, keeps going, you know. The little pigs grow up, be big pigs, he never once says God's name. Lord, Lord Vishnu goes uh, to one of his angelic and we teach him we have these archangels with us you know, as our guides, along with masters and other beings of light that are enlightened. They're each guiding us all this time that we've been down here, all of us have that. Some have one, two, three, five, doesn't matter. We all have that help, thank God. So Lord Vishnu sends one of his angels down, says, go, go tell uh, Lord Narayana in pig form to come back here now. So the angel goes down and says, God wants to talk to you. Pig dies, comes back as, Lord, as Narayana goes to Vishnu, Lord Vishnu. Uh, I don't know what happened. He said, that's exactly right. You forgot, just like everybody else. So now you can have compassion for the human beings that come to earth and forget who they are. So here we are. We've had, what, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years almost here on, on the planet. And we think we're pigs. Really, we think we're human beings. It's not true. One day.
day we all wake up. Why not tonight? Why not now? Where God come on earth pretending to be human beings. It's Halloween. We're all in costumes. God in disguise. This is the truth. Now you may think, like, I'm glad Larry isn't here in this moment. <laughs> he keeps asking me, don't say I am God, I am not different from God. People don't understand. They get turned off if you think you're God. Oh, God's the ocean, vastness, infinite, all oneness of everything, unmanifest and manifest. The beauty and the power of the Creator who created all of us and everything we see. Yeah. Can we ever be equal to that? Impossible. But we can be the drops in the ocean. Why not? And when the drops of rain that fall into the streams and the streams into the rivers and the rivers into the bays and the bays into the ocean merge in all that beauty and love and oneness, what happened to the drop? Can you distinguish it from the ocean? We're drops in the ocean of God that from our birth never lost our inheritance, our heritage, our birthright. Sai Baba puts it this way. He says, you are God. I am God and I know it. You are God and you don't know it. You're all the avatar. Sometimes the avatar has all 16 powers of God. That's how many qualities there are. 16, including omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence, and all that. The avatar comes with all 16 powers. Human beings, as God incarnate in human form, come with some. One, five, seven. Hilda had many. You know, um, when Hilda was here, we used to stand behind Hilda, Danny did sometimes. I did. Snarl and sat next to Hilda and help. The fact of the matter is, why? You know, she didn't need us to help, but she would walk around normally loving God. She would just say, I love God, I love God, just love God, just love God. Everything is done for God. We help each other for God. We help God in each other. Everybody's God. The bricks are God. The building is God. And then she'd say, okay, let's go eat some chocolate cake. Because if she started on that too much, she got into that oneness, and really her body was so sensitive, it, it couldn't handle it. Couldn't handle that fine-tuned vibration of oneness. It's a lot of energy. So she used to say to us, oh, you know, okay, we can go so far. We love God, we love God. And if you say that too much, she starts burping. In the end of her life, she started having heart attacks a lot. Now, some of it was like taking on the world's karma. A lot of it was she was just getting too refined for the body, and the body couldn't handle all that energy anymore. So she would ask some of us to stand behind her in the meditation, because when she led the meditation on Thursday nights, she just let loose. She didn't hold back. She just said, God, flow through me to everyone here, and let them realize who they are. In love and surrender, let us realize who we are. And so Hilda, in that moment, would just leave the meditation and really she was so ethereal that sometimes, in actuality, she started kind of lifting off in a way. I never saw her levitate. She did levitate when she was younger a little bit. There were a couple of incidents. But really, her body was, she wasn't in it. And so we would hold her, I held her shoulder often, just to keep her here, because I was just so dense, it was like a, a air balloon flying out with an iron anchor on the ground that was so you know, full of ego and everything like that. And I was still there. The fact is, she only went into that oneness on Thursday nights. Sometimes on the, uh, Tuesdays or Saturdays or Fridays in the classes there, but rarely, you know, rarely. But Thursday nights, she just let it go. And she used to say, my body's suffering because I can't hold this vibration of oneness for very long. And I, you know, she, when she used to eat, she drank Coca-Cola, chocolate cake, and she had cheese sandwiches, and she liked peas and mashed potatoes and other things like that. Cantaloupe was one of her favorites. But the fact of the matter is, who goes and eats chocolate cake and, you know, 
Coca-Cola as an enlightened being, and she was fully. So the reason, it was similar to Yogi Ram Surak Kumar smoking cigarettes. Are you kidding me? Smoking cigarettes? Why are you smoking cigarettes? It's bad for your lungs. It's bad. It's really wrong modeling of behavior. But Yogi Ram Surak Kumar smoking cigarettes, but the smoke never came out. You'd sit with him. He'd smoke a cigarette, and it just, we, we try to see it coming out. It never came out. And Hilda said, well, he's taking on your karma when he does that. He keeps it inside. And Yogi Ram Surak Kumar would never say that. He'd just say, oh, I like these cigarettes. But you know it grounded him. And that's what he used to ground himself. He didn't have chocolate cake and pizza and stuff like that there in India. I tried it once in India. It was horrible. It's definitely not like Brooklyn. But the fact is, this is what the enlightened beings did. So you might say my relationship, I have a relationship with God. Oh, that's nice. You know, I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. I'm, I love Jesus. I'm his devotee. Well, that's nice. That's very nice. That'll take you this far. And then, like Jesus said, I am the Father of one. How are you going to get there? And how long are we going to stay this far? There's a lot of devotees of God. There's probably billions on the planet. The Muslims all consider themselves devotees of God. Jewish people consider themselves devotees of God. Indian Hindus consider themselves devotees of God. Buddhists consider themselves devotees of God. Catholics, Christians, definitely. I'm devotee of Jesus. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I love Jesus. Yes, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. He'll save us. Yes, he will. He will. But why not be God instead of just a devotee? Why not let that duality go? say, I and my father are one. And why not do that tonight? If not now, when? Some people say, well, you know, how can, I don't understand this I am God thing, you know. I don't understand Jesus saying, I am the father of one. I think that I have a relationship with God. I want to be a devotee forever, like Hanuman and Ram. Three qualities to God that every religion on the planet acknowledges as being in common. Om omnipotence, right? Omniscient. What's the third? Omnipresence. 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 It means everywhere, all the time. So does that mean, oh yeah, God's omnipresent? Yeah, except for the space that I inhabit. Come on, is there one atom in the entire universe that doesn't have God in it, fully and completely? Is there one molecule, one cell of our body that doesn't have God in it, fully and completely? You might say, well, science says. Yeah. Has science even made one grain of sand. I mean, science, oh, science is so important. Okay, uh, did science do any of this? Oh, well, that's nature. Oh, really? Okay, that's nature. Okay, if it's nature, well, show me. Show me how you can do what nature does. Show me. Well, we can genetically modify things. Okay, yeah, that's terrific. The corn is poisoning us. The cancer rate, one in two. When I was born, it was one in 35 or 40. One in two. Horrible. That's where science has led us. What, where has God led us? Right to this room. And why? Because God needs the light workers on this planet acknowledging reality to light up the rest of this world. And in the midst of the darkness, when there's light, the light, in contrast, is extraordinarily bright. 
extraordinarily powerful. So in this deep yuga of darkness, they say it's the Kali Yuga, all of a sudden there's light and the golden age. How does that come about? In a very tumultuous transition, which we are now presently experiencing. So think about this. Think about this as we proceed through tonight. Do you want to be a light amongst the dark, in the midst of the darkness, fully lit, not holding back anymore? Or do you want to like be one that is trying to understand how I am the light? Maybe it's time to give up that trying to understand. Just be the light. Just be who we are. Let's all just be who we are. It's the only thing that's standing in the way of who we are and becoming who we are is the thought, I don't know who I am. And all the problems in my mind I identify with. Instead of watching them, observing them, and detaching from that thing. The mind, right? It was just meant to calculate how many apples and how many oranges there are. What date do I have to come to the next meeting of the prayer meeting? Hi, Larry. And instead, it took over everything and now judges everything. So just wrapping this up for now. When Hilda told me, go become a social worker, go become a psych psychologist, get your PhD, get your MSW, the mind was incredibly charged up and the ego was loaded. And I handed the doctoral degree over to Hilda. I said, here you are, Hilda, thank you for encouraging me. You, you gave me this degree, I give it back to you. Thank you, with much gratitude. She said, okay, go in the kitchen now and clean the sink. <laughs> <laughs> I went up to Sai Baba in India and I said, thank you, Baba, for that degree. He looked at me like I was a piece of dirt and walked away. Seriously. He didn't talk to me for the next five years. And when Shivananda, Dr. Shivananda, went to his guru as a doctor, he had his guru made him peel potatoes for three years after he got his MD. Just think about this. The mind ugh, takes over everything. It becomes a loaded antique of an instrument that's just ruining reality. Why follow it anymore? Wow. So that took um, two hours and 45 minutes to get here. It's a 40 minute ride.
First, I'd like to start by inviting everyone to the Hindu temple in April, I think. Uh, it's an opportunity to come to the Hindu temple that Hilda helped st establish out in Flushing. And it is a beautiful experience to go through the puja. And then to go downstairs and we celebrate Hilda with another special meeting downstairs with people talking and singing and sharing. So you all are invited, if you haven't seen it before, look for the announcement that Jed will send out sometime in the spring, early spring. Yeah. We'll figure it out. But you're all welcome. Mm -hmm. And you're welcome to sing again. <laughs> <laughs> I thought for a moment, I have to read this. I'm, I got up in the middle of the night last night, around 3 o'clock in the morning, and started crying, and this came out. <laughs> I don't know how good it is, but I, I feel inspired by it. I thought for a moment I would share a bit of my relationship with Hilda. Yes, you heard me say the I word. I try in all my writings never to use it. However, tonight I'm talking about the little I, Merlin. I came to her apartment in the city one Sunday night to watch television with others. Before the evening even started, I was asked to go and sit in the living room on the floor. As I sat there, I looked around, and I felt so special just to be there, and began to feel like I, I felt when I sat in the sand waiting for Darshan with Sai Baba. And I thought to myself sitting there in Hilda's living room, this is like being in Sai Baba. And just, I just sat there marveling for a moment about how wonderful it was to have this experience. It wasn't really a conscious thought, it just kind of came up. And just as casually that I thought it, I forgot about it. And then unexpectedly and quietly, Hilda appears at the entrance of the living room, looked over at me and said, Thank you, Merlin. At first, I didn't know why. Then I remembered the thoughts I just had. My relationship with Hilda was more like being a member of her family. And tonight is about family. I can't explain why I felt that way. It felt she treated me like a nephew, like a son, like a brother, or a relative of some kind. Not just a student, not just a devotee, not just another face among the crowd around her. She made me feel special, and I was interest, and was interested in my life, and knew about my life even when I said nothing. She has healed each of us. She taught us to help others by first helping ourselves out of wherever it is that we thought we were. Yes, she saw us for our potential, and not always for where we might have been in our lives. And yes, she helped each of us to become a better person. I felt Hilda treated me as an equal. When I tell the story, don't take it that it's just me. Experience it. Feel it for yourself, identify with the idea that suddenly you could, you could be someone that's standing there talking to Hilda, even if you've never personally, physically met her. You don't have to, you can talk to her anytime you want, and she's available for you. So it isn't about, the story isn't just about me, it's about all of us and how we can relate to Hilda and how we can relate to the world around us. It isn't, isn't it an odd thing to say? that Hilda treated me like an equal. I knew she loved me. She asked for me more than once when I held back and let others get closer. I knew she loved everyone, but like everyone, I felt sometimes her message, her examples of how we might live together were messages just for me. I think we all feel that sometimes. If you listen to the stories people tell, they're not me stories, but they're personal stories. And you go, each story is different. Each relationship is different. It, and it fits us. We spent all morning in the kitchen preparing for lunch. 
I loved being part of the team cooking for 110 people back then, with Ray Zar, Bob Fetter, Lucy, sometimes Kathy, and I remember Andrea in the old days cooking with us, even Shanti and Molly and others. On one of those occasions, there was so much love and abundance around us working in the kitchen that I went around and filled all the containers on the counters, one being a gallon jar I refilled with almonds. Later that day, Hilda was in the kitchen talking to someone while putting her hand in the full jar of almonds that had been refilled. That was how she thanked me. For the thoughts, without paying any attention to little Merlin, she showed me she appreciated the effort and the love and the sense of abundance that was felt while doing a simple task in the kitchen, helping to prepare lunch. And yes, I was ecstatic. I'm not saying this to brag. Hilda really wants us all to know how available she is right now for each of us. How she is here for each of us right now. Hilda doesn't want us to see her as some superior being on some distant cloud remote and too far up the ladder to be part of our lives. She looks forward to the day when we all know we are her family and we all can do as Hilda has done and more. Please, let us treat others with this same love that I know Hilda has treated each of us. Happy Christmas, Hilda. Let's do uh, the Gandhi prayer. I offer you peace. I offer you peace. I offer you friendship. I offer you friendship. I offer you love. I offer you love. I see your beauty. I see your I hear your needs. I hear your needs. I feel your feelings. My wisdom comes from a higher source. My wisdom comes from a higher source. I salute that source in you. Let us work together. Let us work Open your arms, close your eyes, take a deep breath. From the top of your head to the tip of your toes, let a wave of peace come through you. Let there be light all around through every cell of your body this night. Let your hands become hands of light. Repeat after me, I establish myself this night. I establish myself this night. In the power of the Holy Spirit. In the power of the Holy Spirit. And commit myself. And commit myself. For the light to work through me. For the light to work through me. By the bond of our love together. By the bond of our love together. May this body be consecrated. May this body be consecrated. As a station of light. As a of light. Put your hands on your heart and breathe into your heart center and let a smile come to your lips as you exhale. Breathe love into your heart and breathe love out to the world. Breathe love into your heart. Let a smile come onto your lips and send it out to the children on this planet. One more. Breathe love and send this love out. Now visualize your hands being filled with the Holy Spirit and put your hands anywhere on your body that is in need of healing this night. Wherever it might be, wherever you might feel, If you need to get right consciousness, put it on your head. If you need to open your heart, put it on your heart. If your digestion is poor, put it on your abs. If you have back pains, put it on your lower back. Hands of light. Now we're going to send an ohm out to all of your loved ones this night. Anyone who's in need, and I want to tell you, Elizabeth called, she was going to speak tonight, but she's feeling under the weather, so she said, please have everyone pray. 
Lisi was going to speak tonight, but she's under the weather. She said, please send energy my way. Nicole out on Long Island, she said, please send energy her way. So for all of the people who are not here that's part of this enlarged family, and for all of your relatives and loved ones, your immediate family, whomever is in your world that needs a blessing tonight, and who doesn't, let's send out an ohm, a powerful ohm, that touches everybody's lives this evening. Take a deep breath.
breathing in love, and send it out. Okay. I too woke up early in the morning and wrote some notes. They were as good as yours, though. Yours was divine. I had uh, one of my patients came in and said the concept that most influenced his life was a simple sentence that he had heard somebody say. And I, I was very curious. I said, what is it? He said, don't have a negative thought for more than 30 seconds. Don't have a negative thought for more than 30 seconds. Because if you do, it takes root inside of you, and it festers, and it grows like a weed, and then it can open up a door that you don't want to go down. And I was so taken by that, I, and I kept trying to hear more, you know, tell me more, and he just kept saying the same sentence over and over again. I thought he would extrapolate on a whole lifetime of trying not to, uh, be negative for more than 30 seconds, but that was enough. That was enough. And it made me start thinking, you know, it's your mind that needs lessons in self-control. And Hilda always used to say this, the mind makes a good tool, but you don't let your mind do the work. You know, I mean, it does your work. It's not the ruler, it's the servant. Right? It's your higher self that tells your mind, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, because you can use your brain like a computer. You can use it like a calculator. It can get you to a lot of good places, but you never let it go uncontrolled. Because when it gets uncontrolled, you get in trouble. And that's when the 30 seconds are up. And you know, when Bram Stoker wrote the book uh, Dracula, right? Um, he, he put a couple of very interesting things in the literature because if Dracula came to your door, this is, this is what it would look like. Good evening. I'd like to talk to you about something very important. Can I come in? Now, if you invite Dracula in, it's the end of you, right? So you have to have the discernment to decide that this gentleman at your door uh, is safe or not safe. And Hilda always used to say, if you used to remember, she used to say, when those guys are handing out uh, on 42nd Street on Broadway, they're handing out those flyers, no thank you, no thank you. Because when you take one of those flyers, you take on that world, you take on that vibration, you take on that, that individual's stuff, right? So I'm always telling people, pay attention, right? as if you say yes, you'd be dinner to Dracula, right? So you have to pay attention to where you put in your mind. So then that brought up this whole lesson that I just want to read. Be ever so vigilant because the dark side is much, much more sophisticated than you can imagine. It is fueled by the Earth's natural order and it can lurk in the shadows of your lower self. It can come up with ways to throw you off your spiritual path that are brilliant and to you personally devastating. Remember, there is no good or bad in this, just opposing forces performing their endless dance of life on this planetary level. It's the way this place has been set up. Don't gripe, you will go beyond it in time. There are three main ways the dark side will try to keep you from coming into your power. First, it will bring up your old, neurotic tapes and inequities. You know, the circumstances that have pressed your button since you were a youngster. These button pressing annoyances can include your fears, your insecurities, your jealousies, your impatience, your weight, the size of your body parts, your hair, or the lack of it, um, <laughs> the size of your nose, the size of your butt, all in all, your immature ego stuff, right? Your ego junk, so to speak. The dark side will find ways to mess with you 
endlessly keeping you on the treadmill of reacting to all this stuff. Like a bad dream, you'll be on a permanent detour, a victim of your ego and of your mind. That is until you stop feeding it. And when that happens, you will move on and lose interest in fueling and supporting your lower ego junk. So those old tapes that we have, they come up all the time. And, and when you have an, an astute teacher, they know how to find it. And you know how astute Hilda was. Hilda would find all of your things, all of your junk, all of your inequities, your fears, your insecurities. She would be like a surgeon, like a spiritual surgeon, in fact. And she'd cut out all of this lower ego stuff, or she'd give you a lesson. Now, very often it was very compassionate, right? She'd make you aware of it in a compassionate, loving way so that the light would go on in your head and you'd have a little epiphany and you can get the lesson. But if you don't get the lesson, you keep getting it over and over until you get the lesson, right? So you have to look at all of the, the reactions that you have, all the negative reactions as your lower baby stuff. That's the first way the dark side can keep you on, the, on that treadmill. And most of us, we still carry things someplace deep down inside that we can find. You know, it's like, wait till you go to the Christmas party and, and your uncle comes up to you and says, hey, how you doing? Hey, you're getting fat there, huh? Hey, hey. Or, did you gain weight? You're, I don't remember your butt being that big. <laughs> oh, Larry, you're getting bald on top. You, you can be a Franciscan. <laughs> And all of those silly things that we, eventually we overcome, we hope we overcome, but still we carry a lot of them. That's the first way. Number two, the temptations of life can be very attractive. Money, power, security, security is a big one by the way, companionship, status, very alluring, very intoxicating. After you have made the decision to grow, that's when the fun begins. The tests will come when you least expect them, from left field or right in your own inner circle. Do you remember what Al Pacino says when he plays the devil in the movie's Dev Devil's Advocate? He says, I'm the hand of Mona Lisa's dress. They never see me coming. All right. Imagine you're eating really very well, perhaps for the first time praying, meditating regularly, staying optimistic, you're exercising, you're taking your vitamins, you're studying, really getting your life together, and then poof, you show up on the dark side's radar and suddenly you get this great job offer. Or the seemingly perfect man or woman comes into your life. Or the investment of a lifetime becomes available. Or you fill in the blank, right? All the dark side needs to do is to give you a detour. A continual detour, right? If we can be detoured at critical times in our life, our life can amount to nothing much really. Because, you know, if you ever really come in fully into your power, if you ever really knock out all those dark lower sides, all the ego stuff, and you really step up, and you really step your game up, you're going to touch thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people's lives. So the dark side doesn't want you to succeed because it wants to keep, its job is to keep chaos. Your job is to, to uplift and inspire. So it, the more you uplift and inspire, the more the dark side is gonna bang at you. And it's gonna find all your little nuances. It's gonna find all those crutches that you can fall on. But if you ever really step up, the world changes, the world changes. But it takes a great deal of bravery, right? So all the dark side needs to do is to give you a detour, and if it can be detoured at critical times when you're taking your vitamins, you're exercising, you're eating well, you're staying positive, no negative, Larry's quote about never more than 30 seconds of negative in your mind, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do that. Oh yeah? <laughs> well, it's a hard battle. 
right? Knocking out the lower self. Most people go from one detour to another and at the end of their life, you can hear them exclaim, I had so many dreams, so many opportunities. I don't know where the time is going. Just yesterday, we were all kids. You were all like five years old, seven years old, 10 years old. Then you became teenagers, then of course, college grads, then of course, young parents, and on and on, and it went like that. And now, poof, I'm getting bald, right? I don't remember, I had more hair than anybody. So I decided to grow it again. <laughs> See what happens. Right. Just remember Jesus out in the desert, he drew a sacred circle around himself for protection. When the devil came and did his best to lure the master over to the dark side, Jesus was capable of resisting. Be on the lookout for the detours. Pay attention and use a jaundiced eye. All right? When somebody makes you an offer that you can't refuse, it's probably a good idea to refuse it. At least until you Really look at it very clearly, very succinctly. Pay attention. That could be Dracula, right? In another way. I had a gentleman that came to me, and he really, for the first time in his life, he was a student, you know, taking a, our massage program, and he changed his diet, and he started exercising, he started meditating every day, and he was never happier, and his life started turning up so well, and then the tests start. And the first test was an ex that came back into his life who was a drug abuser, and she said, please take me back, I've cleaned up my whole life, I wanna be with you again, and, and it was so sincere, but he was fooled a bunch of times in the past. And this time, I told him right before it was gonna happen, I said, look, you're really doing great. Because he came to me and said, Larry, I've never been happier. I've never been this together in my life. And I said, okay, get ready. <laughs> the test is coming. Because he, he said it out into the universe, you know. And the tests started coming, one after the other. They kept hitting him. And each one was better than the other. It was like, great job, a great investment, all of these things. And as soon as he would take them, the next 10 years he'd be working on that house. Or the next five years he'd be working on that financial portfolio. And he would have lost all of that that he had gained. And that's how it works. So you have to be clear. Sometimes all of the riches of the universe is not worth it. Not if it sells your essence, your love, right? What was the best day of your entire life? What was the, what was the top 10 days? What was the top 100 days of your life? If you live 100 years, that's 36,500 days. Imagine we have a big calendar behind us and each day we get to cross off one of the days of your life. And now it's gonna get a number between one and 36,500. And that's gonna be on a scale of one to 10, the best days of your life or the most profound days of your life the most memorable days, which doesn't necessarily mean that it was a good day, but it could be memorable, right? But what would it be? If you were thinking about it, would it be the day you graduated high school or college? Would it be the day you had a baby? Would it be the day that you got married? Would it be the day that you got confirmed or had a bar mitzvah? Would it be the day that um, your mother passed away, right? A profound day. Right? But in the top 100 of your life, and now if you look at yourself at this age that we are now, how many days do you have left? If you live, well, I, I wrote it down. I actually did the math for us. If you live 10 years, that's 3,650 days. Some of you are only gonna make 10 years in this room, 
right? So you got 3,650 days left, and you better start making them good. You better start making them really good. You don't have time for negative crap. You don't have time to get upset any longer because the clock is ticking. <laughs> and you have a short period of time to not have us lie at your funeral. You know how every time you went to a funeral, that person was the greatest person that ever lived? Right? And you know it's all BS. And of course they're saying it to console the family, etc. and I get that. But every once in a while you get somebody that you really can be truthful about. Like at Hilda's memorial, everything that was said about Hilda was bona fide. She earned every accolade. She did try to feed the hungry. She did try to clothe the naked. And so many of you, right? But you got 3,650 days. Now, if you're going to live 15 years, that's 5,475 days. If you get 20 years, that's 7,300 days. 30 years is 10,950. We'll round that off. If you live another 30 years, that's 11,000 days. You better make this one of the best days of your life, right? Because there's no guarantee you're going to get 30 more years. You might just get a couple more days. Right? And if that be the case, then step up. Step up your game. Step up your life. Make it that good, that special. So that then we can say, what a beautiful person. We're going to miss that person. That person was outstanding. Let that person be you. Let that eulogy be yours. So now you've got to think about what do you have to do to get a good eulogy like that? Maybe you have to say hello to every single person that you come across on the bus. Hey, how you doing? Nice, nice tie, man. Oh, buddy. Yo, yo. What's happening, Mac? Right? That kind of thing. Or maybe you have to find something beautiful to say to each person on every given day. Or maybe you have to thank people for being in your life. I don't know how you're going to go about doing it, but find a way. Right? Find a way. Good? One of the last sermons of Dr. Martin Luther King was about serving others. Oh. Essentially what he said was, um, he don't be first amongst yourself, be your servant. And the thing I like about that today is that everybody can be first because everybody can serve. And the prime directive on this planet, and you know, if you read my newsletter, I'm always saying the same thing over and over again, in different ways. But the prime directive on this planet, the purpose of life is to grow in every way that you can, and then to uplift and inspire wherever you go. To make a difference. So that we really will miss you. Right? Because, you know, the moment that you're gone, you're gone. That's it. No one's going to ever remember. Maybe a couple of friends will say, oh, yeah, I remember um, Jimmy Durante. But no one else is going to remember, unless you're old, older, something like that. So you only have this opportunity while you're here to make a difference, to touch people's lives. Devote your life to making a difference. Devote your life to serving others. Devote your life to uplifting and inspiring. This year, when you go to Midnight Mass, don't go to find Jesus at the church. Bring Jesus with you. Right? You bring the Spirit. You are the eyes and arms and hands of the Most High. Right? The Essenes said that women were called the daughters of God and Men were called the sons of God. Not the son of God, the sons of God. That was changed later, 300 years later, right? You were all the daughters and sons of the Most High. You got good lineage, right? You got good breeding. You got really good DNA. Now use it, make a difference. Wherever you go, let everybody say from now on, I love Natasha. She's so outstanding. I love Danny. He always makes me feel so welcome and so wondrous. And that was the amazing thing about Hilda. Everybody felt that Hilda was talking to them. 
could be a whole room at that cathedral, but Hilda was talking to me. She knew what was in my heart. She knew what I was having the problems with. That's where we have to be. Everybody that comes into your world, greet them and welcome them with those open arms. But be discerning, right? Be discerning, have a joyless eye. Don't be a dummy. Right? Don't get thrown off your path. So I told um, somebody the other day, I said, you need the armor of St. Patrick. She said, what's that? I said, you know, Hilda always used to teach about the armor of St. Patrick. She used to have you stand and visualize the armor all around you. And it was firm, the master's armor. So then when people would send all their negative on you, all their judgments, all their, their cranky stuff, it would bounce off. Couldn't touch you. I wasn't taking that in. But you can still send out your love. You can still send out your joy. You can still uplift. You can still pinch a cheek. And each and every one of us can do that. And the time is short. Now, you guys, you guys are young, so you all have plenty of time. But for the older ones here, the clock is ticking. Let's go. And you know what? Young people all of a sudden disappear also. So everybody has to step up. Step up our game. Make a difference on this planet. One person can change the world. You know that. You've seen it. You've seen Hilda. This one little lady in a short period of years touches tens of thousands of people and it's still touching, it's still spreading out all over and in many different ways. So that's, that's, my, that's the whole talk for tonight. Step, you know, step up. And here's my 10 commandments, but now there, there are 13. This is Larry's 13 commandments. All right. Number one, thou shalt grow in every way possible. Evolve yourself. Number two, thou shalt serve, uplift, and inspire one another wherever you go. Number three, thou shalt be a co-creator, right? A co-creator means that you're the sons and daughters of God. You can make a difference. You can speak, All right? Make a difference. Number four, thou shalt have a viewing point. That was Hilda's lesson. Don't play victim. Nobody can make you feel bad without your permission. Have a viewing point, not a point of view. Number five, thou shalt have wonder. Thou shalt have wonder. I told you the story the last time Hilda took us all to see In Search of Noah's Ark, the movie, that night. I think I told that story. Maybe it was a year ago. So Hilda takes us to see this story, In Search of Noah's Ark, because she felt that if God can talk to you in the same way that he talked to Noah, get prepared, that would be a good thing. So she started us doing that standing meditation. And she wanted us to stand in the middle of chaos and listen and get direction so that whenever your life is turning up badly, you get quiet, go inside, and get uh, your path. Be told the path. So she takes us to see this movie, and the movie probably was the worst movie of all time. <laughs> but I sat next to Hilda at the movie theater, and, and Hilda talks to the screen, you know. <laughs> But, but the guy in the movie theater was the doctor that, that made the movie. He had a bad toupee. And whenever his head would go up and down like this, the toupee would flap. <laughs> and that kind of like took me off of the, the subject matter. So when we got out of the movie, Hilda, Hilda you know, she read, reads minds like Merlin said. I mean, she just would read your mind all the time. And it was like a kind of mind-blowing type of thing. And, and she must have read my mind, because I'm sitting there saying, right, you know, one of those. And so she turns to me, she, she bangs me on the chest. She says, wasn't that a great movie, kid? <laughs> <laughs> and I was just overwhelmed with light. Overwhelmed and 
it's almost like the tears almost came out of my eyes and I was just lit up. Talk about Shakti Pop, right? And all I can say was, yes, that was a great movie. And for years and years and years, I thought that was a great movie until I saw it again. <laughs> and then I remembered how bad that movie was. <laughs> but Hilda had wonder, and she turned everything into wonderful. Mm. And that was a good place to be. She didn't allow the negative to dwell for more than 30 seconds. She turned everything. So she asked me every year, we used to do a fundraiser at WBAI. And she said, Larry, would you do the fundraiser with me? And we did it for two years. And people would call up on WBAI and call in with questions for the great spiritual teacher. But you know, WBAI is, is a, an interesting station. And they, all the people that belong to them, some of those people don't really like us, that spiritual stuff because they think it's you know, silly and a crutch. And so people would call up and they'd be yelling at Hilda. And Hilda would just go, oh! <laughs> and she would just go above it. And when we got into the, the car, going, the, the cab going back home, she said, wasn't that wonderful, uh, what she could kid, wasn't that wonderful kid? And I was thinking about all the people that were yelling at us, you know. Well, Hilda, oh yes it was, Larry, it was <laughs> terrific. <laughs> was it. She always turned everything into wonderful. And you know what? It's a better way to live. It's a better way. If you want to have rose-colored glasses about things, she never had rose-colored glasses about anything that was serious. When it was about life and death situations, she, had, she was solid as a rock, and she had clarity, right? And she had insight. But on these silly things, it's water under the bridge. And that's the way you have to look at it. Have wonder and let the silly things go. All right? Next, thou shalt have fervor. Mm -hmm. Fervor is the intensity. The, um, the drive of life. Her book, Hellbent for Heaven, was all about that. You want to get into heaven? Then be hellbent. You want to go to Carnegie Hall? You got to be hell bent. You want to be a great musician? You got to practice ten hours a day, like Vladimir Horowitz. You want to be great at something? You go for it, and you got to do it all out, all out. Those are the people that make it. Thou shalt have fervor, right? I learned that directly from Hilda. That was that was Hilda really epitomized that. Hell bent for heaven. Thou shalt be generous. That's the next one. Thou shalt be generous. Michio Kushi once came up to me and said, out of nowhere, he was just walking through the hall and he said, Laddie, give it all away. Give it all away from your heart and you'll be the richest man. And then he just walked away and he tapped me on the heart. Tapped me on the heart. And that was a, that's a good lesson. Be generous. Generous with your love. Generous with your compliments. Generous with your gifts, whatever it might be, be generous. So that's a good path to follow. Generosity. Thou shalt strive for excellence. And I got that one from that that movie with when Keanu Reeves was a little kid. Uh, Ted Ted's Excellent Adventure, mm -hmm. where they say it, the the mantra of that movie is be excellent to each other. <laughs> It was great. Like that, and they played the guitar. Be excellent. Thou shalt strive for excellence. Be your very best. Every single moment that you can. Give, give from your heart. Be the best that you can be. All right? Next. Thou shalt celebrate the sacredness and divinity of all life. I don't even have to say much about that. It, it, it shouldn't upset me that people say that bacon is their favorite food, things like that, but I always want to put a picture of the slaughtered pig, you know, when they say something like that, but I don't, right? But I still think I react when it comes to animals because animals are like, you know, have a soft spot in me. But 
the sacredness of all things, everything is sacred in this world. This is all God's creation. It's all made in the image and likeness of God, right? And when I say God, I don't mean that there's a guy sitting up in a chair upstairs saying, oh, you are very good, you're gonna win the lottery. I think it's more like that movie where the guy, the scientist that was handicapped and he was looking for that mathematical equation to explain all of life, that perfect little equation. You know which movie? It was, it was nominated for the Academy Award last year. He was in a wheelchair. Stephen Hawkins. Stephen Hawkins, is that it? Right, right? I think it's a little bit more like that. You know, if every action is an equal and opposite reaction, it's the same as what you reap is what you sow. I think you can, you can couch all of spirituality in, in scientific quantum physics terms, or we're getting closer to being able to do that. So I think that it's much more intelligent than just thinking that there's a, you know, a big guy just lashing judgment out. I think it's more intelligent in some way. At least, I don't know. I, I might find out. And now I'm going to go up there and there's going to be a guy sitting in a chair saying, oh, you're fucked. <laughs> but, but sacredness of all life. And here's the last, last two. Thou shalt forgive. I guess that's the biggest one. I guess if you sum all of Jesus' teachings up, I think that was the big one. Right? Thou shalt forgive. And we're all bozos on this bus, right? That was, that was the Fire Sign Theater's favorite line, we're all bozos on this bus. So I'm thinking that we're all capable of making big mistakes, right? So I think forgiveness is hard, and particularly if you have somebody that's battered you, and has hurt you, that's a real hard one. It might be the last one that you ever do in your spiritual path, but I think that's a good one. Thou shalt forgive. That's gonna have to take some work. I'm gonna have to come up with, with a real spiffy formula for that, of how to do that, you know, for people who have been badly bruised in this world. And I don't know how. You know, I don't know how to do that. I'm going to need some help, you know, on that one. But thou shalt forgive. And the last one, thou shalt love with all thy heart and all thy soul. And that's the path of this class. That's Hilda's path, the path of love, the path of bhakti. Hilda was a great bhakti yoga, a great bhakti yogi, yogini. Right? Her whole life was about love. And that's our path. And so that one, maybe that one should be the first one. Thou shalt love with all thy heart and all thy soul. So if I was rewriting the Ten Commandments, those would be my commandments. Um, because the other ones I think we got already. And after um, that comedian who did the Ten Commandments, what was it? The Irish guy? Very funny guy, George, Car uh, George Carlin. Yeah, after he did it, you realized, oh, well, it's time to change. This is the new one. This is the new one. You got it hot off the press. Let's do a song, kids.
speaking, I think of Hilda, because she looks more and more like Hilda's energy, but day by day. I thought about inspiration, I thought about Christmas. He said something exciting. No, he said inspire us. So um, I woke up this morning, and there's a book that I write in after meditation. And I found something that seemed to sum up all the things that everyone talked about, including the eye bit. Do you know how hard it is to write a letter mm -hmm. without putting I in it? And that was one of Hilda's things when she asked us. She said, try to take I out of it. So anyway, so then I had to write a beginning. And I said, this season, when we celebrate, we've already celebrated Hanukkah, the festival of light, we celebrate the birth of Christ, and we refer to this as the light of the world. It's one of the same, isn't it? So what it felt like was we celebrated the festival of light, and then Jesus came. He came in matter. He came in person to show us what light really is. Can you see that already? Light, kind of compressed into one little body. When you think of the little Christ, the little baby in the manger, how explosive that light, that's the festival of light. It is his birth. We come from a Monday. Tonight, let us feel and recognize the light in our soul. The light in our soul. We get so mundane. Larry, you said that. We get into the wants, the desires, the criticisms, the comparisons, the feeling of not good enough. All those, they're all emotional things. You know, us human beings like to feel, feel in our body. So we create situations so we can feel this body. But it can be in a negative form. It can be that dark Dracula that shows up. And then we harp on it, and we harp on it, and we feel, and we feel, and we forget one thing. We forget that light. That one little spark of light that dwells within every heart. We allow all the mundane things, the extra car, the home, the relationships, we allow all those to sort of put this dark, cloud around that spark, that spark that is our soul. It's pure. I want to take just two minutes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. And just go into peace. Bring the mind into a silence. Bring the mind into a silence. If you don't know how, ask Jesus. Jesus, quiet our minds. Let it be quiet. And now go inside. For inside, there is a light that is so bright. And then go into that light and tell me, what do you feel? What do you feel when you go in that light that is inside of you? You can say it. Yes. Bliss, yes. Come on.
want to say it nice and loud, feel it and say it. Claim it. drop in the ocean that Al said. It's that drop that just melts into the one, the one God. Feel it. That's you. The rest has no meaning. That is all that you are. Aren't you wonderful? You are wonderful. You are shining. You are compassion. You are love. You are bliss. You are all that God is. You are all that could possibly be. Yes, hiding in the mundane. This is the place to go each day. Find the things that makes your body start to feel, feel, whatever it is that you feel, or, or an emotion that shows up. And in that moment, quiet the mind and go inside and find the soul. And you'll see, please experience this, you'll see when you go find that soul, those emotions disappear. Those emotions disappear. So tonight, let us experience the light of our soul that is reignited in us again and again as we celebrate and open up to the possibility that Christ in us is forever burning waiting to be acknowledged. Did you acknowledge the Christ in you tonight? Did you acknowledge? And then I want to tell you what I wrote. What I wrote about soul. And it wasn't me who wrote it, because when I read it, I thought, wow, this is cool. So here it is. <clears throat> soul has no words, for it has no opinions, criticisms, or judgments. It has no speeches, nor great lectures. It knows all. It sees all. It hears all. It has no need to prove itself, for it is all that can be without pride. It never needs to prove anything, for soul does not compare. It is one with everything. So why would it oppose itself? In the quiet of no words, it delivers the message. In ways that we don't know, it serves creation. In ways that we don't know, it serves creation. It comes forward in perfect time, with action and or words. So we don't have to be thinking about how we're going to do anything. It'll come. When we come from soul, the perfect thing will happen. The perfect word, words will come out. The perfect action will come forth. Soul has no needs nor wants.
in soul, all needs are met. In the light of our soul, we are guided to find the truth of our consciousness, which is the truth of all consciousness, because we are one with God. We reach into our knowing and connect with the Satchitananda, Satchitananda. That means we connect with Sat, which is love, Chit, knowledge, and Ananda is bliss. And I leave you with that tonight. So when we say home, that's 100,000 times proven by science. The vibration. When you hold that, it rattles and the recording won't be good. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just lowered a little. 100,000 times the vibration. 100,000 times the vibration of the spoken word. That's the power of all. When you say a mantra, like the one we're about to do that embodies Hilda and brings her vibration into us. That's even more that. So we can say it's a million times the power of the spoken word. When we have our vibratory rate at a million times what we normally walk around with in the day, that's God. That's a good thing. <laughs> Science proves this. They did this experiment and they proved it. All right. So, ready? One million times to spoke the word. We call Hilda into our hearts, into our minds. May we be surrendered to that she embodies. Love, God, oneness.
love in to our hearts, breathe it in, fill with it. There are thousands of beings, masters, and loved ones with us this moment from Hilda's side. For the earth, through us, and all the warriors of light, the workers of God here, this is a fantastically wonderful moment in Christ. So breathe this love in and breathe it out through the top of the head. Breathe it in again through our heart centers and let it spread throughout the body, this temple of God in which we dwell. And then breathe it out through the top of the head. On the other side, Hilda's class is thousands of people, thousands now, and they've joined us which were their anchors on earth to bring the light here tonight and through this year. So breathe this home in again. And then breathe and fill with it this temple of God in which we dwell. And then breathe it out the top of the head when you're ready. This love fills us, thrills us. That's all we really are. Embodiments of love. That's our nature. That's God. So expand, expand, expand. Beyond this body, expand through this earth. Our body which comes from earth is earth. And then expand into the golden light 
that encompasses the entire universe of God is golden light of love. Yeah. This is the Father, Mother, God in which we dwell. This is our soul. This is our oneness. Beyond that, we are. Letting go, whatever's holding you back, just let it go. Like you would drop a cloth that you're holding onto in your hand, just let it go. All concepts, all mental structure, all thought, even feeling, just be the one love you really are, the oneness of God, your birthright. Our beautiful oneness of consciousness that we just so wonderfully brought us into. That we are. We are free and we bring freedom.
Let this be right.